conscious uh, development of conscious alternatives. But it was not until the Amazon that I saw that this was possible in a way that was accessible to me. So then I concentrated on those people, those chemical families, and that uh, that then became the compass for all the work that I've done since then. And uh, I regard the degree more or less as a joke because uh, it was self-directed study. They don't really, uh, there is no degree in shamanism. But my interest was basically one in the phenomenology of religious experience, religious traditions worldwide, and uh, primitive people against a background of tropical nature. And uh, stumbled onto the mushrooms in the jungles of Colombia in 1971 and was not even particularly interested in mushrooms at the time. We were looking for a less well-understood drug that is still not discussed much in the literature, but exists in a very circumscribed area among three Indian tribes. And we went into the jungle to stay at a mission that served these Indians. And the priest at this mission had cleared pasture and brought in white cows and there were many, many of these mushrooms. And as soon as we started experimenting with them, I realized that what I had been told about psilocybin, which was that it was analogous to LSD, but simply required a larger amount for the effect to be present, was uh, a complete simplification of the issue. And actually then psilocybin became the focus of my interest, and by extrapolation, the other uh, tryptamine-related hallucinogens. And uh, a great dream of mine and of my brothers as well was that the mushroom must somehow be made accessible to people so that they may judge for themselves the difference. And uh, we worked with this over a number of years, and in 1975, we succeeded in growing it by a method that had previously been used uh, only in the laboratory on commercial grocery store mushrooms to study their genetics, but it turned out to be perfectly adapted for growing this mushroom. Within a matter of months, we had written Psilocybin, the Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, and uh, the information was moving out into society, but more important from our point of view was that the mushroom was again accessible to us so that we had psilocybin in a form that was certified pure by Mother Nature. And that like initiated the second phase of uh, our work with these drugs, which has carried us up to the present day. And it's basically uh, a project of taking the drugs, calling attention to uh, the differences, the uniqueness of the state, and trying to attract other people's attention to it because uh, I have, we have a very deep intuition of its importance for the cultural predicament for mankind generally. And uh, this is how we come to where we are today, basically. You just mentioned that the, that the mushroom is really important for our country right now. And you perceive yourself as an advocate to bring in to our culture a new element, like a, 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 an easy way to reach altered states of consciousness. What can we learn from these experiences? Well, the first thing that we can learn is that they exist. In other words, that uh, perhaps it's a truism in the 80s, but at one point uh, it was thought that there were two states of consciousness, awake and asleep. Now there is a gamut of these states, but I still don't believe that the people who deal with consciousness realize uh, how mutable consciousness really is. There is a prejudice against the use of drugs because there is an inherent dualism in, built into Western thought, 
where people value the experience if it is uh, endogenously produced, produced through ordeal or personality or uh, dieting, but is undervalued if it uh, comes from drugs. This has, in my opinion, held back the Western development of understanding consciousness because quite simply these states I do not believe are accessible by any means other than drugs and this is heresy to a number of people but the evidence that I lay in favor of that contention is uh, the history of uh, human art and literature and music and painting is surprisingly uh, empty of the motifs which exist in the tryptamine-induced uh, ecstasy. And always when I speak of hallucinogens, I'm speaking of this limited family of drugs, not LSD or ketamine or mescaline, but psilocybin and DMT and combinational drugs which utilize strategies for making that effect uh, noticeable. And my career is to point at this place in nature, which I've stumbled upon, and to say, uh, what is this? What do you make of this? What are you, the physicist, you, the psychologist, you, the after-death researcher? What do you make of this uh, place? And Even the most sophisticated consciousness researchers tend to hurry over drugs or to focus on one drug to the exclusion of others. And yet, psilocybin has not received this kind of attention and treatment. And why that is, I'm not sure. I think that, uh, that the element of terror involved in doing it, the fact that it does not bathe your ego in a cloud of certitude or assurance that everything is going to be fine. It is much more cut and dried than that, and uh, it's a challenge. It is uh, when you are out in the billows, as I call it, because it seems to come in in waves like sets of billows, when you're out in the billows, you are against the power of mind, uh, up against the power of mind to such a degree that you know that the entire enterprise hangs in the balance, that no matter how much you've been told about dosage and this kind of thing, that the mind actually holds the key to life and death, and that uh, those parts of your control board which are normally masked from you are suddenly unmasked and the buttons are there for you to manipulate to the degree that you understand them. And uh, there is an element of risk. I never tell people that there isn't, uh, but I think that the risk is worth it because I think these bizarre dimensions of beauty and information are actually, uh, it is an intimation of these things that gives human history its coherency. In other words, this is not a peripheral issue to the general uh, phenomenon of human becoming in time. It is actually because the evolution of the human species is the evolution of the human mind, these consciousness expanding agents actually anticipate uh, an end state uh, in the evolution of the human mind. And so they cast enormous reflections back over the historical landscape. It is they which generate uh, religions and physics and messianic careers and outbreaks of uh, uh, great psychic uh, accomplishment and uh, uh, disgrace. And uh, until we understand this, until we understand that there is a teleological object at the end of human history and that it can be known, 
we will continue to live the kind of limited intellectual existence that has characterized the last 500 years or so of Western development. So psilocybin, tryptamine, is in my opinion the, uh, the means to eliminating the future by becoming cognizant of uh, the architecture of eternity, which is modulating time and causing history, essentially. How do you perceive in this context the future of mankind and the human mind? Well, I've said many times, the human history is a, a lunge across 15 or 20,000 years of time from the primitive stone chipping primate to that creature which will walk into a trans-dimensional vehicle and leave the solar system and human history and the concerns of the human monkey far behind. And <clears throat> this may take a thousand generations of people, but as a biological fact, as a, an emergent process of planetary significance, that is only a, a microcosm, uh, I mean a microsecond of cosmic time. Uh, the immediate future of man lies in the imagination and in seeking the dimension where the imagination can be expressed. The present cultural crisis on the surface of the planet is caused by the fact that this is not a fitting theater for the exercise of imagination. It wrecks the planet. The planet has its own ecosystemic dynamics, which are not the dynamics of imagination. In space, the physical space that surrounds the planet, the modalities of imagination will be the limiting cases of what man can be done. So I see uh, man becoming an artist and an engineer. In other words, flowing into our ideas, perhaps more than we dare even now suspect. In other words, uh, a possible end state of that kind of technical uh, evolution would be uh, the interiorization of the body, of, of the human body, the individual body, and the exteriorization of the soul. And this seems to me to be what the recovery from Adam's fall uh, allegorically is getting at, that the soul must be made manifest and eternal and the body must be incorporealized so that it is a freely commanded object in the imagination. And what I mean by that is uh, something like what William Butler Yeats is getting at in his poem, Sailing to Byzantium, where he speaks of the artifice of eternity and talks about how beyond death he would hope to be an enameled golden bird singing sweet songs to the lords and ladies of Byzantium. In other words, it's the image of the human body become a, an indestructible cybernetic object, and yet within that indestructible cybernetic object, there is a holographic transform of the body, and it is released into the dream. In other words, the after-death state is actually the compass of human history, that we are attempting to undergo a complete death of the species, and as we struggle with this concrescence of Thanatos, there, is, there are problems like nuclear stockpiles and all these things arise, because the message that we're trying to read is the message we most fear to hear, which is, uh, that you must die to experience eternal life, essentially. But what this death that we're talking about is, is an understanding that the human, the Dasein, the being of human beings, desires to be released into the imagination. And until we confront death uh, with the attitude that it is the after-death state that needs to enter history, 
there will be a great deal of anxiety. It's like a birth. Uh, you know, a birth is a death. Everything you treasure and believe in and love and relate to is destroyed for you when you leave the womb. Uh, and you are launched into another modality, a modality that you would not perhaps have chosen, but that you cannot do anything about. So I, uh, I think these drugs anticipate this, because I think that uh, time is the moving image of eternity, as Plato said, and uh, these drugs place you outside of time. Now the mechanism of how that's done, you can invoke, Bell's theorem, or just call it pure magic, but uh, it does happen in the here and now. It is accessible. It is not. Uh, it is not something remote from us. But somehow the clamor of the modern world and in the search for answers, people have feared to place themselves on the line and to actually wrestle with life and death out there in those strange bardo-like dimensions, not realizing that there is no other way to win true knowledge. I mean, it cannot be easily come by. There is no knowledge without risk-taking. And uh, I see the human future uh, emerging along the lines that the mushroom visions have insisted upon proliferation of electronic media, the densification of information, the breaking down of consensus reality, the uh, uh, breakdown of a coherent uh, dogma at the center of physics. All these things uh, indicate that it is slowly becoming understood that the modality of being is the modality of mind. And once that realization is placed in the center of someone's thinking about the world, the importance of these drugs will be seen to be paramount. And once that culture places that understanding uh, in the center of its model of the world, these drugs will then point the way uh, and we will be much closer to the end of history that I think we all uh, desire consciously or unconsciously, a, a cutting of the Gordian knot and a release of the human species and individual into the dream, basically. And uh, primitive people, meaning pre-literate people, they just have circumvented the entire process of history. They have leapfrogged over us. They are already in the dream. They have accepted the drug on its own terms and, uh, and assimilated it and live with it. The problem with that, for them and for us, is that we are destroying their world and our intellectual equipment is such that we can never have that, uh, that naive epistemological approach to these phenomena because we know about techni, we know that energy can be manipulated to achieve effects, and so it isn't enough for us to try to recreate uh, the shamanism of pre-literate people. We have to go into the shaman space with the a priori categories of Kant, with the eidetic reduction of Wittgenstein, with the ideas of Merleau-Ponty and Whitehead, all the intellectual equipage of our culture must be carried with us into that space to attempt to map it in a way that will be relevant for us and that will point the way toward a shortening of this period of uh, uh, shock and the accumulating shock wave, like the bow shock of uh, ionized particles or energetic particles meeting the magnetic field of the planet. That's what the chaos at the end of history is. Were you just talking about the bell theory? No, I'm talking about a shock wave which precedes eschatology and is uh, modern times, basically. I mean, it has been increasing throughout history, but as we grow closer to this moment, where uh, the human mind will evolve into hyperspace, uh, 
the confusion, the amount of contradiction, the amount of, uh, well, Q it's called in engineering, just the amount of vibration in the system is increasing to the point where it seems like the system is about to fly to pieces. This signals to me that the onset of the, uh, of the primal crisis, that when we have gone through it, we will then live in this, uh, in this realm of altered understanding that psilocybin and these drugs anticipate. And it isn't a coincidence that they anticipate them. It is, uh, in fact, uh, what eschatological time is, is what they reveal. That's why the cultures we find using them are eschatological and historical uh, cultures. What is the bell theory you were talking about? Well, the Bell theorem is simply an interpretation of an experiment in quantum mechanics which seemed to suggest that information is non-local. In other words, that uh, everything about everywhere can be known here and now because somehow all information is cotangent to every point in the matrix. I uh, don't uh, pretend to have the background to judge the Bell theorem. What I would say about it is, if it isn't true, something like it must be true to account for the informational content of these uh, drug experiences. If you just take a simple behaviorist model, uh, what is in your head, if behaviorist and reductionist evolutionists are correct, what is in your head should be very uh, adapted to the here and now. It should be efficacious information that bears on your survival. Instead, what we find when we uh, take these drugs is a density of information, an alienness of information, an inapplicability of information to the human condition that suggests that information is available that has no bearing on the life of the individual or his uh, uh, the success of his evolutionary strategy and i just cannot believe uh, that these things are built into the human psyche i have as i said i was involved with Jungian ideas and i those archetypes and those archetypal processes are not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, the thing which, for want of a better word, we call the alien or the extraterrestrial, the thing which comes out of the drug experience that is unenglishable, beautiful, but so bizarre that it seems to exceed human categories. Well, some people talk about entities. Y yes, it can present itself as an entity. It can present itself in a number of different ways. It is, uh, it is the central mystery of our age. We are so alienated, uh, or let me restart that. The, <clears throat> the relationship of intellectuals alive today who are familiar with the state of modern science and that sort of thing to a question like the existence of extraterrestrials is approximately in the same place or degree of closure as the relationship of 15th and 16th century intellectuals to the real properties of matter. In other words, they had only a tenuous grip on the real properties of matter. And consequently, alchemy could exist, could project the hopes of human psychic transformation onto inert matter because so little was known about the real nature of matter that it seemed a reasonable place to expect these kinds of things to happen. The present state of thought uh, today is that it's highly likely that there are extraterrestrials somewhere out among the stars. Our state of, chem the state of the development of our chemistry, astrophysics, uh, uh, linguistics, etc., etc., makes it reasonable for us as moderns to expect that. So then consequently we go into our heads and there seems to be the extraterrestrial. Uh, it may be a true extraterrestrial, but it is odd that it has hidden itself in the place where we expect it to find it. And this causes me to assume that actually it's something far more profound 
than an extraterrestrial. It's something which to gain our confidence is disguised as an extraterrestrial because its uh, real nature is so much more devastating than that, that that is the way in which it insinuates itself into our lives so that we can dream of a hegemony of organized intelligence out in the galaxy that we will relate to and be assimilated into. What I think is going on is that actually the most intelligent uh, life form on the planet is not uh, man and his institutions. It is the, a, the overmind of the human species, which is a diffuse organism of uh, technical artifacts like computers and information transfer and retrieval systems and human beings. And, but human institutions are like uh, myths woven by the individual human cells that make up society. The real controlling uh, modality on the planet is never visible, and it is this group mind, and it controls the release of ideas into history by designating certain people as geniuses, and it's, uh, if, it, if there's a certain kind of imbalance, a certain kind of religion will arise to collapse that imbalance. If, uh, if uh, technical advancement is outstripping the evolution of ethics, a religion can step in to freeze uh, these developments so that one can catch up with the other. And I think the whole consciousness movement and that has evolved over the past 20 years is an attempt to map, to verify, and to open a dialogue with this thing, which is the other, we call it the other, we call it the alien, but it is actually the overmind of the species, and it, it seeks this dialogue. It has been waiting all these millennia to, uh, for us to essentially come to a point of intellectual maturity where we did not then require messiahs, religions, and uh, these various crude, fine, cr crude interventions into the human experience which keep us from destroying ourselves. This is also what Jung called the collective unconscious. Right, but he, he painted it as a very passive kind of thing, more like a data bank or a place where all myths and all memories were. I think of it as uh, a god a kind of God, and I think it, it uh, is active in three-dimensional space. It can be active in something as uh, personalistic and uh, circumscribed as uh, a string of coincidences which you experience, which seem to be turning your life in a certain direction that you may not have expected, or it can be active uh, in, in something like the worldwide phenomenon of flying saucers. Flying saucers are nothing more than miracles, and uh, they occur essentially to be devil science, because science is a human institution that has arisen in the last 500 years that is uh, the dreams of displacing the overmind without ever realizing that it exists Science dreams of this place of preeminence, uh, but science uh, creates alienation, um, species survival problems, all of these things. Now then, the overmind, which can be thought of simply like a, a cultural thermostat, it clicks on when the clash of contradiction between the ethics of a society and uh, some other institution, in this case science, becomes too great, this governing device clicks on and it begins producing those events most destructive to the institution that is seeking preeminence, in this case science. So the inexplicability of the flying saucer phenomenon is its central uh, reason for being 
and all the effort to reduce it to something, uh, metal ships from far away or anything else, is doomed to failure because its very reason for being is to undermine those kind of ontological systems. Uh, why we're talking about this is because psilocybin makes in, inducts you into the flying saucer experience. In other words, a metaphor for it would be to say that psilocybin is a means of triggering the so-called abduction experience or the close encounter of a third kind. Uh, once you realize that, once you've satisfied yourself that that's true, a number of experimental avenues are opened up. A number of different approaches to what's going on are suggested. I mean, here we have alien entities eager to transmit information, eager to carry on a noetic dialogue, and uh, we seem to be ignoring the opportunity because our categories uh, mitigate against us correctly appreciating it. Are these entities coming from outer space, or are they more part of us? It's like impossible to tell. This is the game that you must play with them, is through dialogue, trying to figure out if this is uh, the previously unseen human psyche, or whether it is actually a thing coming from the outside. And it is not an easy thing to decide, because we are so alienated from self, that we don't really know what it would be. Uh, so it's not important to, to know the context. It's more important to know the content. Would be there. The content is very interesting, yes, because even if we were somehow to verify that Bell's non-locality theorem applied and that this, these were real entities around a real sun somewhere in the universe, it would make them no more or less real. In other words, it's a hang-up to, to demand that they appear in three-dimensional space. I always, uh, I have this hang-up, so I, I don't, uh, I don't put it down. I always think of uh, the apostle Thomas, because you'll recall Thomas was not present when Christ returned uh, after, when he rose from the grave, he appeared to the apostles in the upper room, and Thomas was not present. Then later he was there, and the apostle said, "Listen, the master was here, and it was wonderful." And he said, you, know, "You people have been smoking too many little brown cigarettes. That's preposterous." And at that point, Christ walked in, and he said, "He said, Thomas, come, put your hand into the wound, so that you will believe." And so he did, and so then he believed. Well. The moral of the story, as I read it, is uh, Thomas was the doubter. Consequently, Thomas was the only one who was allowed to actually touch the resurrection body. It was because he doubted that he was vouchsafed to this position of preeminence. And uh, I'm like that. I mean, I would like to touch the incorporeal body. I would like to call the saucer down and observe all of its workings. But uh, this is a spiritual aspiration that cannot be advanced by any uh, human technique or activity. This is just something you pray for. Uh, in the meantime, the job is to, to map it and describe it and explore it and try to direct the attention of other people more intelligent than myself to this astonishing fact, really. I mean, I am I'm troubled by the fact that so many strange claims are made today, so many forms of aliens and channeling and voices in the head, that when I began all this ten years ago, I was afraid to speak because uh, I sounded mad even to myself, and I sounded like a voice in the wilderness. Today, the situation has changed to the point where uh, I can barely make myself heard amidst the clamor of people who have various uh, entities uh, from Atlantis and beyond the grave and Zeta Reticuli and uh, what have you clamoring to be heard.